So, okay. So the first question, let's go with the basics. So what's a license and why is it so important? So uh, we have the International Berne Convention and every country has a copyright law that gives the copyright automatically uh, to everyone who creates original code. So you cannot prevent uh, becoming a copyright owner and that's the exclusive right. And if somebody else wants to use that code, they get permission from you. And here we call that permission a license. And also the right created to you is the right to deny others from using it. And you don't actually have the right to use your own uh, contribution if it's part of a larger code where others have already contributed. So you have the right to deny others from using your part but you don't get, get uh, the permission or license yeah. uh, from others. Um, you don't get the permission on the, unless there is a, a permission or, or a license. Yeah. So if you're not careful, there might be a situation where everyone has the right to deny anyone else to do anything and then no one can do anything. Yes, exactly. No one can do anything. And that's yeah. what you, know, you want to avoid. Yeah. Okay. So... Yeah, and this is by default. So I know a lot of times these days people sort of feel, okay, like do whatever, like it's small, it doesn't matter, but really anything when it's made has a license and by default, no one can do anything with it. Yeah, the copyright ownership is created automatically. We don't have to register or do anything mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Okay, so let's say we're talking about software here someone else has created some useful software and you would like to use it. So we're researchers, so let's assume like academic research or something like that. And they, they've made it available on their website or GitHub or wherever. And you would like to use it, but there's no license there. So first off, let's say you wanna use it for your own work. Like you won't be sharing it with anyone else. Do you have the right to do this without there being a license in there? Well, that depends where it is. You mentioned GitHub. If, the, if it's in GitHub, then there you can do uh, something according to the um, terms of GitHub. So when you mm -hmm. upload it to a platform or service, then um, you have to accept the terms of that service. So you have the mm -hmm. very limited rights that uh, GitHub gives you the right to fork. You who use GitHub know better what, what that exactly yeah. means. Mm -hmm. But, but if it's somewhere else without that uh, term, without those terms, you can't even use it in private use, at least not in Europe. So mm -hmm. we, have the, we have the directive, uh, the computer program directive that prohibits even uh, private use for, for software. Yeah. So you do have to get the permission even for your mm -hmm. private use, which is different from all other kinds of works, because usually you can make a copy of a, uh, of a, for example, article or, or uh, yeah. make a copy of, 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 of a photograph, for example, photocopy for your own private use, but, but software, no, not even that one copy yeah. for your private use is allowed without the license. Yeah, so that's really interesting to me. Like I always had this idea that with copyright, sort of, if you're not making the copy yourself, then that's okay. But actually you can't even use, so, that means anything without a license is basically off limits. It's basically off limits. Of course, then there comes the question of, will you get caught and will there be <laughs> consequences? Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but basically the, the, uh, it's, it's very strict, even the tra transient temporary copies of, of software and databases are yeah. prohibited as a, as a rule. Yeah. I mean, this seems like the kind of thing where most of us are doing illegal things if you're doing anything with software, unless you're very careful. But, That's yeah. true. If it's not licensed, then everybody is in danger of, of, of infringing copyright. Yeah. So, okay, now the next case, let's say that there's a paper and the author says, okay, please email me if you would like the software and I'll send it to you. And then you email them and they send it to you but it doesn't include a license file and they don't say what the license is. What can you do in this case? Well, that's a tough one because of course, 
if they do that active act of sending it to you, then then I would say there is some sort of implied license, but then I would be very careful about it. So it would be better if you would email them back when you have that mm -hmm. contact and ask that, yeah. would you agree to, for example, license terms under yeah. MIT license and right. what is the attribution you want to use yeah. in that case or somehow try to get uh, get more information. Like yeah, I think the email thing is sort of uh, still because you have that contact and you can communicate so you can get mm -hmm. additional permission. But then yeah. the, the first thing is you find some somewhere in the internet some unlicensed code and you cannot mm -hmm. contact. Right. You will not yeah. get an answer from the. Okay, so that's the case where it's on someone's website, free mm -hmm. for anyone to download. That doesn't mean that you can actually use it if you download it. Uh, well, yeah, just having something up in the internet doesn't, it's, it, that, that's not a license. Yeah. Okay. Um, one question that came up earlier today when we were discussing this, what if someone sends you something and they ask you, okay, like, can you please help me fix this code? I guess that's sort of an implied license because they're asking you to do something. They're asking you to modify it. So yeah, uh, yeah, there are like the copyright includes the right to make copies, obviously, mm -hmm. and then it makes uh, gives you the right, exclusive right to uh, make it available to the public, and then it gives you the exclusive right to modify. And yeah. uh, the Copyright Act is written so that the right to modify has to be agreed specifically. So um, you mm -hmm. always the license terms always have to take into consideration that, and usually the license terms give you that right to modify because that's the whole point uh, in, in yeah. actually all the open source law okay. licenses that they do give you that modification right, but it yeah. has to be written into the license term. And then the copyright also includes the moral rights, the right of paternity, so the right to be attributed as the, mm -hmm. as the writer of the code, and then the integrity right which is sort of within that right to modify so yeah yeah so okay so this is the case let's say someone sends you something and you have this right either explicit or implied to use it for yourself in, as part of your research at a university what if you need to share it with the rest of your research group in order to do your work would this be allowed without some further well, agreement. Well, if it's come from the outside the university, then again, not unless mm -hmm. you have sort of told you in in, in that if, if there are emails that you know mm -hmm. I would give this code for my for my research yeah. group. So depending on that, but then um, actually the copyright di directive on on computer software in, in Europe says that employer is the one always. Uh, owning the code that the employee, the person employed in that right. organization writes. So yeah. basically, if it's uh, somebody in the same university, then your common employer would be the owner of the code and would yeah. probably, you know, mm. give it to be mm. used by all the all the researchers in, in yeah. that in that university. So it, so, it, so it would depend on who has who has written it, but it could be that. Yeah. The whole of the university could use it because it was owned by the university as okay. the as the yeah. employer. Okay, I think we'll get back to that about stuff that's developed internally. So yeah. I guess, given what you've said, if a collaborator outside of your university wants to reuse the code that you've gotten from someone else, that's definitely a no. You can't resend it on. Yeah, you would need yeah. that clear license. What you can do with it and. Uh, if you if you don't have it clearly, if you don't have some user rights clearly given to you, then mm -hmm. you don't have them. Yeah. Everything that's not clearly given to others is still the exclusive right of the original yeah. copyright owner. Okay. So what about the other way around? So let's say I, working for the university, make some software and... Um, Let's see, what's the question here? So if I don't license code created in my project while I'm working at the university, 
So can other people in my research group use it? Yeah, because that's, if it's owned by the university. Yeah, if it's owned in Finland, we have we are now disclaimer. We are talking about European copyright law and especially Finnish copyright law. We have this um, uh, we have this uh, original feature in Finnish copyright law that if you do independent work for the university, then you own that as an individual. So it would depend. But if you were working in a research project. Uh, for example, externally funded research projects. Then again, university would be the owner. Uh, but but then when you write the code, uh, there's the likelihood that you can also yourself, as a person, or um, or then the organization where you work, you could be be a licensor. So in the beginning, we talk about the term license, which is permission with with some terms for use, and then when you give the permission, you are a licensor. And mm -hmm. then when you get the permission, you are a licensee. And mm -hmm. in the beginning, we talked about your rights as licensee, but then when you write the code and you may want to make, make it public, then you become a yeah. licensor. Mm -hmm. So this independent work exception for the ownership, is that, a, is that unique in Finland or is it in European law? No, because the European directive says that for software, the employer becomes the owner. Okay. So it's only Finland we have this extra. Yeah, right. that, that's my understanding. Yeah. Everybody knows different from, for example, we had people from Netherlands, please put it in the chat or then correct yeah. me. But I think it's unique in Finnish. Yeah. Finnish. Okay. So then I guess going back to this mixed thing, if you make some software partly on your own time and partly as part of a research project, then I guess no one has, this is the case where no one has right to do anything with it unless you come to some agreement. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a messy situation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, this part of the code was written on my own time. This was written during the university mm -hmm. work hours in a project. So it's, it's very messy. And um, we have our university commercializes quite successfully, actually. Um, intellectual property created at the university. Um, yeah. and, uh, but, but then um, we don't commercialize all the code that is done at the university, obviously. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the code is, it's, it's totally okay uh, to publish it, uh, open access by, by the researchers yeah. who do it mostly. So, we have the innovation services, but in order for them to commercialize uh, this, if, if it's created as university property, then we do need actually the, the researcher to become a champion, champion for the commercialization. Okay. So mm. it's, it's not okay. like we want to own everything. We want to have societal impact with the research and the open science right. movement is strong. So if in most cases, okay. we don't have practical problems with the code being created in a messy situation, if it's then licensed openly according to the mm. open science principles. Okay, yeah, so let's, so let's say, let's expand on this some. So let's say you make some software and you want to make it open. So at Alta University, as the example, what would someone need to do in order to actually put that license on there and say it's open now? Well, um, we have um, the if it's a project, then the principal investigator should be consulted. Is it okay to publish this as a open mm. source code? And technically, if it's owned by Alta University, then the decision to commercialize or not to commercialize would be made by the head of department. Okay. But it, it could be that there is a department policy that says that department is committed to open science, yes. whatever that you can usually, unless you are working in a project that has definite goals, because we can have, mm -hmm. if the project goal is one of the goals, uh, one of the deliver, deliverables is to produce commercially proprietary code as commercial product, then mm -hmm. obviously you cannot 
publish right. that. Yeah. But, but mm. depending on the data management plan, what other deliverables, if there is the idea to publish open research data and then open source code, uh, open code licensed with open source license to, to use that research mm. data, then, then that yeah. would be enough that, the, that it's uh, okay yeah. for the principal inf investigator of that project. Okay, so, and I guess ask the principal investigator, and if they need to, they can ask the department head or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah that, that would be the process yeah. at, at the university. And then if they are going to, if you're going to commercialize, is that something that's always goes through the department head? Yeah, that's the decision of, of the department head, but also um, the innovation uh, university innovation services will, will help yeah. with that commercialization. Yeah. So there's a question in chat. Is there a difference between commercializing and publishing? Yes, definitely for software. So you can just publish without the license. You can publish with, uh, with a permissive license like MIT license where you give everybody the right to use, or then uh, you can um, you can make it available uh, um, to with with a strong copyleft license, so mm -hmm. that it's not able to be used uh, uh, as proprietary license. Or you can you can publish it with actually in Alta University a research some researchers published their mm -hmm. uh, code uh, with. Um, Creative Commons non-commercial license, which is not actually an open source license because it says nothing about the code, but but they 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 use that quite successfully. And then later, there was a company interested, and they sold the commercial license with to the to the commercial company. So definitely, you can put it out there yeah. with a restrictive license, and then double license it later mm -hmm. and and sell. Uh, yeah. sell, um, sell, sell that uh, additional licenses for yeah. commercial use. So, yeah. So, like, commercialization can be done or not. Or commercialization is a separate aspect from publishing, and you can do both, or you can do you neither. Can do or either yeah. Thing. You okay. can do yeah. both. With, you can have your cake and eat it, too. You can publish mm -hmm. the code with mm -hmm. a restrictive license and then double license commercial licenses later. Yeah. So, Does this happen very often? Not really, I would say. And um, it's an option we try to talk about because it could be lucrative, but I think most of the code would be just, just yeah. published openly with the permissive license. Yeah. So here's another good one. What happens if some Alta University personnel made their work open source without asking for permission from the department head first? Uh, like how well, if it's not if it's not against the goals of that uh, research project, so if it's within the goal, if if it if it doesn't uh, if it if it doesn't um, infringe on any any goals of 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 that research, then probably there are no uh, no um, yeah. consequences. But but if it was definitely to be kept yeah. as proprietary code, and then you would then then you would have. But I haven't, mm -hmm. I don't have information that this would have happened. But usually yeah. the research group know uh, what are the goals of their work. Mm -hmm. are, are they are, are they trying to get a proprietary code or are they uh, going to do the yeah. uh, make the code available according to open science yeah. practices. So it's sort of like you might get in trouble with your particular project, but the higher level university is not going to care if it's okay for the project or something uh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, like, I'm, I'm not like advocating anarchy, but the practical <laughs> thing yeah. is that there's a lot of code being written every day. And we mm -hmm. don't have the resources or the interest to commercialize everything. Yeah. And, okay. and we want, want everything that the university does, we want it to have a, the maximum societal impact. So we are not gathering IP just to you know, make sure that nobody else uses it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's either commercialization of the results or 
open science making available as open science with, within yeah. the open science framework. So those are the two ways of having societal impact. Yeah. Okay, so last question before we move on. So what happens if you're working on something at a university and then you leave the university? Can you still use the code that you've written there? Uh, if you choose the permissive licenses like MIT uh, and you publish it in GitHub, then anybody mm -hmm. can use it. And you can also use it later mm -hmm. in your next uh, university or even yeah. if you move into the corporate world with the MIT mm -hmm. license, mm -hmm. you can use it uh, anywhere. So basically it's good to license it because then you can still be using it. You can still yeah. use it. Otherwise you won't even have access to the stuff you've done. Exactly. If you don't publish it in, in a repository like GitHub, then you don't have, um, you don't have yeah. access to it and you don't have the license. You don't have the permission to use it. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the next topic, which is about the differences between the most common open source licenses. And do you have any advice to researchers about which one you might choose for different circumstances? I think Richard, you you would have a more uh, information, but, <laughs> but I think generally, I, I if you don't have any specific goal in mind, I would recommend MIT because mm -hmm. that has the obvious advantages. But if you want to create a, a community, then a share-alike license, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, like the, uh, the share the license which says share-alike, but anybody mm -hmm. who copies that part of the license, then you they have to share it with the same terms. So that okay. helps build that community. I see. And and then if you want to do the double licensing, then the Creative Commons non-commercial, even though it's not an open source license, but mm -hmm. it actually does work for double licensing, or then a very restrictive, like a viral license, uh, strong copyleft license that makes it impossible to make that into proprietary code. And then you have the possibility mm -hmm. to, to um, give the commercial license or, or permissive license later for a fee. Yeah. Uh, or, well, commercial license later for a fee. Okay. Yeah. So maybe like three categories, like the most permissive, do anything, yeah. even make it commercial without me, yeah. or the share alike or weak copy left I see you wrote here, which is yeah. the stuff that you've, the exact things you've made need to stay open in the future. Yeah. And then finally, there's the viral or strong copy left, which is anything which is combined with this also needs to be equally open. Yeah, yeah. So which, it, it's viral. It contaminates everything it yeah. touches. So everything which, becomes non right? Yeah, which incidentally doesn't mean people can't make it commercial. But if a company does make these strong copy left things commercial, their software has to be equally open. Yes. So in reality, it's like they're not selling the software, they're selling the services for people to use the software somehow. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a very good clarification okay. to make. So you can always sell services, but the code has to be free. It cannot be yeah. proprietary code, but you can always sell services on top of the software. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see... I Any think, more direct questions about I think these? there was a question about the articles. Was there something about? Yeah, OK, maybe we can. Well, actually, let's let's articles. come back to these in a little bit. But yeah, the article and supplementary information are very good questions. I haven't forgotten them. Yeah, good. Um, for, oh, and there's the question, can one double license a strong copyleft software? Yes, that's exactly what. Maria was talking about. So you have the strong copy left for the public release. And if a company did want to make a product without the copy left, then they can get an additional license from you. And that's a very common thing, I think. Yeah. So all, always the only one who can be the licensor is the owner. So uh, if you own something, you can first give 
a strong copyleft license and then later to what you own, you can give a commercial license. But obviously you can never license somebody else's property. So mm -hmm. you can't okay. really license somebody else's code, only what you have yourself paid. So the next question written down is, what license do you recommend for academic projects? Or is that basically what we've already said? I think we also did. So generally, MIT, if you don't have a specific goal in mind, or the, yeah. uh, or the Berkeley 3, uh, which, which has mm -hmm. this additional, uh, MIT just gives, says to you that if you, attribute, if you attribute me as the writer of the code, or if that copyright notice, uh, then you can, and, and you keep that, license notice there and the copyright notice then you can use it to mm -hmm. whatever you want and you can make it as part of proprietary code so yeah. you have that attribution term in every license yeah okay so the next question was is there any specific research data on the effects of choosing a copyleft license versus a more permissive open license like does the copyleft uh well, does either of them increase the contributions back to the code over the other one? Um, so this particular question says someone's at the moment is leaning to a copyleft license for an extensible program, but it will have plugins. So basically people can make extra um, additions to their program. And the plugin authors should be able to choose any license they want. So they say the GPL seems incompatible with this model, I guess because it's viral. So the plugins would have to have the same GPL license. Yeah. yeah. So is there any other license that would be a better fit? And is this like what I heard? There's the LGPL or lesser or library general public license, which I remember it's sort of something exactly for most like plugins and things that link to it don't have to be GPL but the main core is do you know anything about that no this i have now i have to say that it's too 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 detailed now exactly okay. <laughs> sorry yeah. about that. i think richard you have the best yeah and enrico in the chat is recommending uh apas 2.0 mm -hmm. but i'm not yeah. sure if it's exactly for for, for this but there are there's the you know the yeah. Uh, the gray area between permissive licenses and and then the strong copyleft is is a very it's also very technical and um, has a lot of details and you have to look at it I guess case by case and yeah I, I can't I, I can't give you exact advice sorry yeah I think Apache too like Enrico said is sort of a um a it's like the, it's a very permissive license, like MIT. Okay. Okay. But then it's not going to do exactly that. Yeah. But yeah, for this question, I think I would look at the LGPL license. And I think that's sort of designed for this kind of case. Okay. Um, of the popular license, okay. So there's some categories of very popular licenses like MIT, Apache, BSD, GPL, and so on. Are there ever cases where you would recommend someone to use a more specialized license, like something that's not very popular? I think the popular licenses have become like standards and standard just makes life so much easier. And for mm -hmm. the popular licenses, you can find the articles and the experts who know exactly how that license mm -hmm. is, is applied uh, into your case. So. Uh, I I haven't seen any case where you would use something other than the yeah. popular licenses. Okay. So I That's think good. it's it's okay. usually sa saves a lot of trouble when everybody knows the license terms. Yeah. Okay. So the last question in this section. So do you recommend? Like for academic projects, do you recommend non-commercial or academic only licenses? Like, are there benefits and problems in this both ways? Yeah, it's always like the societal impact or do you wish to receive an income for, for yourself or for uh, your department? 
Um, so, or, so most most researchers maybe unfortunately are not that into becoming entrepreneurs and commercializing it. So mm -hmm. if you don't have goals in that direction, then I would say most academic research yeah. should could use the, the MIT or the permissive licenses. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, before going on to the next section, let's go back to some of these older questions. So there were the several, like what happens if you put the code into the supplementary material of an article since journals request an exclusive license to that article. Although I think, well, this was a long time ago, but there was one journal I looked at and the supplementary material was explicitly excluded from the article license and could have a different license to it. Although I guess that's specific for the journals. Yeah, I think journal articles usually just want, my understanding is they just want the copyright ownership for the article and you can have that um, that um, software you can have the under you can have the software in for example github and you can have the data in any data repository research data underlying that article so uh, so my understanding is that you have just have that um, underlying research data and under and and then the uh, the software to use that research data, you would have them in, in a separate repository. It doesn't have to be the publisher, and maybe the publisher doesn't mm -hmm. even have a good repository for, for the code. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that. But then again, I would have to read that specific publisher's um, terms. But I think it, yeah. usually it's just um, availability policy. The, uh, Publishers want that the research data is available in a repository and you have the software so you can use that research data so it can be reproduced. So that adds tremendously to the quality and then you will get more citations when you have the research data available and also that software so that uh, other people can, can repeat analyzing that okay. underlying research data. Yeah. So the next one, similar in a similar one. So let's say you get some code as part of an article review, like you've been asked to review the article and the code doesn't have any license on it. Are we allowed to run the code or only look at it? If, it, if it's given as a material for the, for the review process, then I would say that the author of the code has allowed yeah. the use for the publisher and for the review process. And it's actually probably articulated in the agreement that the, mm. that the writer and the publisher have made, which maybe okay. you, you are not yeah. given that, but it's probably on the website. So yeah, yeah, you can use it in order to, what for what you need, whatever you need to do to, to review the quality of that article. Yeah, okay. So the next topic, so how detailed of a license file is needed? Like if you look at the different common recommendations you find online, it says, make sure there's a license file in your project that has the entire text of the whole license. And then for every single file in the project, have a header that lists all the authors and the year and the copyright and so on. But what if someone doesn't do this? Like what if there's only the license file in the repository or like they've forgotten to add these headers to some files. Like how much is just needed here? I think you at, at least you need the copyright notice. So you always need to have the copyright notice which has the copyright owner and the contributors if they are other than the copyright owner. So for example, if it, the copyright owner would be Alta University and then the contributors would be individual researchers. So you would have mm -hmm. the um, copyright uh, name of the copyright owner, oh, the copyright, and, and then actually the year it's first published. And mm -hmm. no, you don't have to um, update that year. So it's the year it's first published, and then the, uh, yeah. the copyright owner name, and then the uh, contributor names. Yeah. So, so you would have at least that, and then the uh, license notice, that what, what license it is licensed under, 
And then I think if you have the short licenses with a very short text like MIT, you would have the whole license text, but, mm -hmm. but the bare minimum is the copyright notice and uh, the like no, notice of what is the license mm -hmm. it's licensed under. And then I think the instructions for the really long, for the old uh, copyleft licenses are extremely long. Well, my understanding yeah. is that for them, you actually only have the copyright notice and the okay. license notice. You don't reproduce the whole yeah. long and, text. And is this once per project, like in an overall license file or every file separately? Because I can say for almost every project I've done, I have one file called license that says, okay, this is under this license. I usually don't list the authors because it's not going to be kept up to date. People can get that from the history of the version control system. Mm -hmm. And then for every file, like basically never, like I don't have time or I don't remember to do stuff, do that very regularly. So. Well, I think, as I said, I don't write code. So I think you, you are the better expert here, but generally in, uh, in copyright, uh, we do have now the, problem with missing metadata. So mm -hmm. the general idea now is that every file should have enough metadata in that file so that everybody knows the exact copyright situation, the copyright owner, the yeah. copyright license for mm -hmm. that file. Because mm -hmm. otherwise in, in, in our world, then the files, um, Files yeah. can start living their own life, and then mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. longer people know uh, yeah. what what is the who is the copyright owner for this file, who are the contributors, yeah. what is the copyright notice for this file. So yeah. the general rule is that um, every digital file should have that uh, meta metadata that would include the yeah. copyright owner, the the authors, and and the license for, yeah. for that for that file. I wonder if the growth of version control systems, it's like most of the time these days in projects, the files aren't really living separately, but they're all centrally managed in one like together that has the whole history of or really like line by line, everyone that's modified every single line with their name and date in it. So I wonder if this has sort of gotten to the point where like people aren't so worried about this because in there. Maybe the other way around. Let's say there's a repository on GitHub that has a single license file, but not a license in every individual file. What do you say that is safe to use? Well, I looked at the GitHub terms and it, it's enough that the repository has a, has a license. So mm -hmm. then everything in that repository is under that license. Yeah. Okay. So I get an idea that, yeah, it's probably better to include it in every file, but I guess well, if, if there are is. other technical, if there are technical solutions to take care of this problem, uh, other than having huge amount of work done for every file, <laughs> then that's that's great. Yeah. And then, yeah. We also use this mechanism for Alto University. We have Alto Open Learning Platform, and the platform has a license, Creative Commons CC BY, mm. uh, and then mm. we just say that anything you upload to this platform is under this license, unless you state otherwise. So. It's a very um, good mechanism to save yeah. trouble. And then if, if you want to upload that, you have to agree to those terms. So I think that's a very a modern mechanism. Yeah. OK. So like it's the platform that's enforcing the license on everything. So that way, yeah. the yeah. individual authors don't have to worry quite yeah. so much. Yeah. And I think I that doesn't that. exactly work on GitHub because like people wouldn't give GitHub code if GitHub set every author. Yeah, no, but you said that there are individual yeah. repositories that have an individual license for that repository within GitHub. And there actually, there is, there are, you always give GitHub some rights to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's someone in comments who said they just looked at a Google repository and there's a contributor file. A contributor's file contains one single name. The repository itself has over 250 contributors. And there's one license file 
And in most of the files, the copyright header says copyright the project authors, which is also something that I've done before. Like this is copyright the contributors. And if someone needs to figure out who these are, well, there's the technical history. Yeah, of course, always as a copyright owner, as the author, you are free to choose how you want to be attributed. So it, it's your mm -hmm. choice. And of course, if it's a project, you can mm -hmm. decide on this kind of uh, yeah. attribution policy. Yeah. OK. So let's go to another topic. So especially for some of the big projects, like, say, Google or Facebook things, if you want to contribute to their projects, they want you to sign a contributor license agreement, or CLA. Or if you're employed by someone, they want your employer to sign it. So I get the idea these are, well, they're either direct copyright assignments, like the copyright of what you're doing is now owned by Google or Facebook or whoever. Or maybe it's a like declaration that you have the rights to add it to the license of the repository. So can you comment some about why do these exist? Um, yeah, well, um, you have to be the owner of the code you contribute. And if you are employed, as I said, Europe has the directive that anything you write as an employee is owned. Uh, the code is owned by your employer, so you would need that. Uh, you cannot sign yeah. Um, agreements about the code in the capacity of copyright owner. Mm -hmm. So you need your employer's signature yeah. for, for whether it's a licensing or transferring ownership of that code. You would need the, yeah. the employer to, to write that. Yeah. But like from the other side, like Google asked for this, I guess, because their stakes are too high somehow. Like if anything goes wrong, then they have huge liabilities. So they. So would you ever recommend being this formal for a university research project? Uh, yeah, actually, we in university research project we do do sign the uh, the, the all the, like, the transfers are signed by persons at the university who have the. Uh, what? have the right to try to sign sign for these kind of agreements but we have for the uh, academic articles we have like this grant back that for academic articles we say to all the university employers that as a researcher you just sign the mm -hmm. publishing agreements for academic articles in the capacity of owner of copyright because we yeah. would need an army of administrative people just to mm -hmm. sign these uh, publishing agreements and, and we want people to publish. Yeah. So well, we have okay. this grant back policy, but we don't actually extend that grant for policy formally to, to code, but then, as I said, informally uh, often okay. can, can, can if, if it's okay in the project to publish it, um, publish it or use it, use it outside university then, then, okay. then that can be done informally. But formally, it would have to be at least head of department to, to yeah. sign. So, OK. And so if, if you were contributing to a project that had a CLA you had to sign, it would be the department head you would go to to sign it, which okay. would mean that you can contribute to it. Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. Um, is it ever relevant to make a CLA for contributing to your own research project within the university? Or is that sort of like too much work? And Well, within the university, if, if, if all the researchers are working for the same university, you could go and assume that this is now a project that is not independent project, and then everything mm -hmm. is owned by the university and, and then mm -hmm. But, but it, of course, you can also, uh, the researcher group can decide that whatever we are going to do yeah. um, in, in this um, cooperation, you already choose a license when you start. And if you mm -hmm. choose a permissive license like MIT, 
the copyright ownership becomes totally irrelevant because when you have, if you if a group of researchers decides that we are going to put this code into GitHub and we are going to choose MIT license for this, then uh, who actually owned it originally becomes irrelevant because mm -hmm. then anybody, mm -hmm. the researchers, um, their their, uh, their 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 friends, their enemies, yeah. anybody can use it. Yeah. So, so I think that's because as we talked about, you know, you write some of the code on your own time, some on the university time, mm -hmm. uh, some are in research projects, some you're doing independently, and it can be very complicated to find out exactly what part of code was written under what circumstances. So I would usually recommend that if there's a group of yeah. researchers start, starting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, starting to write code together, you would... Yeah. Decide on where to publish it and what would be the code, uh, what would be the license for it. Yeah. That would then you would avoid a lot of uh, copyright transfers and yeah. clarification of who owns what and who can sign what. And that's, that's also a lot like what I recommend. I like if someone asks me, I say, okay, we can talk for hours about who owns what you're writing, but just get everyone involved to agree to make an open license and then don't worry about it. Exactly. And that seems like a much more practical matter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because then um, ownership can become like, a, like it, it, it can, the right to use is more important actually than ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next sort of topic. So let's talk about working in a wider world. So, one interesting thing, if you look at the GitHub terms of service, you find that it states, if you add content to a repository with a certain license, then you grant others that same license to what you added. So basically, if you're contributing to a project with a license, then you're agreeing to that license for what you're doing. Do you have any comments on this section? That, that's exactly how it should be. That, yeah. that if somebody has chosen that, that license for that, a repository for that project, then if you want mm -hmm. to contribute, you have to abide by that. Yeah. That, that license. So that's exactly as it should be. So let's say I had some software on my web page, not on GitHub, and it had a license in there. And then someone sent me my, my email something saying, oh, I made this improvement to your software on your web page. Would you like to add it to? to it, but they don't comment about the license, but there's already a license in the repository. Would that be taken as them agreeing to the license? Probably I would, I would assume that they intended to give you that license, but then it, 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 technically if, so. if they would directly upload it or they, if you have a system where uh, anybody uploading something should have to click or maybe again send an yeah. email back that by the way I understood that you are going to agree to this license. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So try to try to get that clarified. So any permission given by email would be uh, yeah that would be okay and then store that email maybe but but um, <laughs> basically so, I, I it's not it's not very good to it's not 100% sure to rely on yeah. that. So, I understand the you know, implications or concludent yeah. permission or implied licensing. So it's, yeah. it's easier if you can clarify it. Yeah. So is it something like if you're Google, that's not OK? If you're a small researcher, then maybe just mm -hmm. accept it and move on with your life? Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry too much if, if it's. Yeah. Uh, if it's, you know, if you have, are using it. But then again, what I have unfortunately found out in my decades as a copyright lawyer is that when people get mad at each other for whatever reason, not at all related to copyright, mm -hmm. and they look around, what can I start arguing about? <laughs> then they, the copyright, because it's, you know, unclear and they're automatic copyright, then people yeah. tend to take up 
um, copyright issues from years back mm. uh, if they have a, some grudge or some you know psychological or emotional thing why they want to um, okay. why they want That's to have an, an argument. Yeah. So therefore, I think very clear just to avoid the yeah. the the pain and and the and the suffering from from a lot of argument and the clear yeah. licenses also help in this regard. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation, but I guess it makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next up, I don't have a license in my repository and someone contributes code to it. I accept the code contribution and time goes on. And then sometime later, I realize that my that the code submitted is unlicensed. If I remove it, has it tainted the rest of the code? What can I do in this case? Well, it can taint. You you cannot have a viral license without the very complicated copyleft mm -hmm. license that was created um, mm -hmm. for for this person. So uh, you cannot contaminate other code without those copyleft terms. So it would be just that you have a part of code that's not clear who yeah. what, what the right to use it. But I would. I, I case, would just clicking, clicking, choosing, choosing a license for your repository would be the yeah. best option from the beginning. But don't be in such a hurry that you don't have that uh, one minute or two minutes to think about the license, or maybe even five minutes to think about the yeah. license. <laughs> but so in this case, is it like since once the code is added to the project? And then the project moves on. Is the rest of the project a derivative work of the code that was added without the license? So then if you remove the original code, what's left is still a derivative work and thus still under the copyright somehow. No, you have the right to uh, what you have created. And if that is removed, mm -hmm. but if, if, if somebody has built on that, if somebody has what, what, it, what is the, because as I said, yeah. the copyright also includes the right to modify. So whatever you contribute, and then that is modified, your contribution is modified. Then for that modification, you would need permission. So, but, mm -hmm. but if it's not built on that, if it's like, take that so, part away, it hasn't, yeah. it hasn't contaminated that if, if, if you don't have, the only way to get this viral effect is yeah. with the strong okay. left terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's something that I, well, maybe now that I think about it, maybe I haven't seen it explicitly, but something like this, you know, if someone adds something, then the whole thing becomes a derivative work and you would have to go back to the time before they first added it. But I guess it's more flexible than that. It, it depends what was the role of that contribution. If it was mm, the building yeah. the, and everything was, then if, if that was then later modified, then that yeah. would be a bigger problem. Yeah. So if it's like some very small thing, then maybe, yeah. But if they like yeah. made a main feature, then, yeah. Mm. And also, okay. copyright actually protects um, form, not function. So if you can add if you can add that functionality and not copy exactly the form of the code, so okay. then it would be okay. So it doesn't copyright mm -hmm. doesn't protect idea or 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 function. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Because it's yeah. something that I've also wondered. So there's common sites like Stack Overflow where people often see code samples. And if you copy that, if you copy the Stack Overflow code and add it to your own, but you're changing the form of it, but keeping the function, then is that no longer a derivative work? Well, I'm I'm or, a member in the Copyright Council, and we have to take um, we have we have given statements on like. There have been two quotes which are compared, and mm -hmm. then the statement is either yes, this infringes the previous code, mm -hmm. or no, 
this does mm. not infringe the previous code, but um, I'm not exactly the member in this. Um, okay. We have an outside expert looking at the code yeah. and, and, and say, saying that, well, now this code is so original that it gets copyright mm. protection in the first place. And then this next code is copying the original form yeah. of the code and infringing or it's not copying that original code and not infringing. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the expert making it, but uh, yeah. it is possible. And in Finland, you can ask for the Copyright Council for uh, okay. an opinion if you think that mm. uh, somebody else has copied your code. And usually okay. these are, are companies because they have enough commercial interests. So these yeah. have not been university researchers who have come to the Copyright Council. It's a service provided by our Minister of Education that you don't have to go to court, which is expensive. You can have that okay. actually free service at the Copyright Council um, opinion on whether whether some work is infringing. Yeah. So okay. there's the question, how different does code have to be? And it can be specified how different it has to be, but 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 I, I can't I can't do okay, it. Okay, so I guess it's sort of deferred to the experts. So yeah, we can, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what if I send code to to a repository that doesn't have any license information? Can it have have any bad effects on me as the submitter? Uh, well, uh, the all the license, all the open source licenses have that no guarantee. Um, section that whatever code you contribute under these open source licenses, you, you provide it as is and you don't give any guarantees for it uh, yeah. that it fits any, any purpose. So uh, depending on where that code would be used, if there mm. then is, a, is a, some, uh, some practical problem for people using that code and it, yeah. uh, something that's harmful, uh, then you are protected because you never promised that it would be working. Yeah. So also in that respect, it's better to use the licenses, but um, yeah. I haven't, I don't have, um, I don't have information that any uh, who writes code would have been held responsible, but the generally you are responsible for the harm you have caused to others. Yeah. I, I don't. There's a, Eric has the legal case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that was about the originality. Yeah, it's true that the code has to be original. So uh, that is true. What Eric writes that uh, original. If if a work is so simple that anybody who would start coding would be would probably write a similar code. If it's not original, then it's not mm. a copyright protected. So it's not that you usually when people create something, they usually create something original, which not someone else exactly would do. But if it's not original, then it's not protected by copyright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that, that is true. So We've come up to an hour, but I guess I can keep going with the questions. Worst case, it stays in the recording and the Q&A that I publish afterwards. Is that good for you? I think we also, we're at the end of our time, but I think we also, uh, for some reason, at the end of the questions as well. Yeah, I've got just maybe one or two more here that I can ask. Uh, okay, so here's an interesting one. So someone asked, a research group gets a code from some other research group that's distributed among requests. And they fill out some form and you get the files. And this code has some custom license that doesn't say anything about derivative works, but it says you can't redistribute this code. Okay, so the group adapts this code over the ne next many, many years like say three years and they're continually changing it a lot and then at some point they publish the paper based on their own modifications and the paper says can you please share your code is this code still under the copyright and 
distribution prohibition of the original authors. Yeah, unfortunately, it is, unless you are given the permission to modify, you don't have the permission to modify. And if it's specifically told that not to redistribute it. So uh, unfortunately, the original copyright owner has that right of modification. But again, if you have something as a starting point, and starting from that, you create something new and original, then that becomes a new and original work. So again, mm -hmm. case by case, but but it would I would not base I would not um, invest years of work mm -hmm. into working um, yeah. on something where I don't know that I have total. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, totally, I guess that I have the right to modify and redistribute that, whatever yeah. I do. So, yeah, so like, don't get in this position in the first place. And if they do, yeah, then they should contact you or someone <laughs> like you. <laughs> well, then, yeah. probably, but they would need to be an expert. But it's yeah. well, United States has the fair use, actually, Europe doesn't have fair use not for computer programs. So I would mm. not trust on the ability to use snippets, not, not, in, not in Europe, not in Finland. So if a work is protected, also part of that work is protected as an original work. So mm. no, I would not trust that snippets would not be protected by copyright. Okay. Unfortunately not. Yeah. So let's all use clear licenses and then we have a lot yeah. of these problems and some of these problems that occur are like time machine problems that the only way to solve them is a time machine but go back in time <laughs> choose a clear license and then start over actually i kind of like that so either choose a license early or invent a time machine exactly you can so decide you two options here <laughs> like yeah okay and I guess if you're a researcher and you publish something without a clear license, don't expect anyone else to use it and cite you. Exactly. At least if they know what's good for themselves. Exactly. And we talked about that citing thing that I think you always have a clear license, but you can additionally ask people uh, if they would be so kind as to cite your article. So you can have mm -hmm. that as mm -hmm. a sort of polite kind request, but don't don't add that in the license terms. Okay. So why why not add the citation requirement as part of the license terms? Um, it just goes back to using the standard licenses as they are. Mm -hmm. And it's just too, I think it's too complicated. Yeah. And in academic circles, citations are often used and it's it's the way academia works that when you get something useful, whether it's research data or or an article or code, then it's it's polite and, and good academic practice to, to cite others. But I don't I, I wouldn't use it in the license terms because it's better yeah. to use them just as they are standard licenses. Yeah. And I guess it makes all kinds of questions like what happens if someone is not creating articles and thus they don't have and they don't cite anyone? Can they use your code? Or what if someone uses just a small bit about it that's unrelated to the scientific topic? Yeah. Do they still have to cite you if it's unrelated. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Try to make using, if you want societal impact, if you want to be cited, try to make uh, using your code easy, easy for, for other people. Okay. So here's a really, if we still have time, there is this sort of long question. So if someone is working in healthcare research and they're working with clinicians in a hospital environment, and I guess in a Nordic country, so they're single payer healthcare. So like all the funding's coming from the state. So would this count as non-commercial for licenses? Like, I guess there's a researcher and they're working with someone that's in the hospital. And then also it goes further. So these clinicians are not the ones that are using the software directly. So like me, say me in a university is working with someone that's in a business 
and the people in the business aren't getting the software directly, but I'm working with them. So, and if the license said non-commercial, what yeah. would? Um, I have a sort of story on that. Oh. So, um, like, well, we, the, there are, there are like, um, not standard license, not open source licenses, but, but licenses that license some software only to be used in the university for education and for research. Mm -hmm. And with the students, uh, we sometimes have this challenge-based learning. So we work in cooperation with the company. And we had this kind of software that we only had for university, the educational license. And the students made something that was useful for a company. So I, I was able to ask that um, computer, uh, the company that owned the computer software that uh, the company wants to use this uh, result. Mm -hmm. And they said that as long as the company who wants to use the result, as long as they have bought the license uh, mm -hmm. to run that software, then it's okay if they get that, you know, education license okay. uh, result. Yeah. Uh, they can use it. So because that computer mm. software company, they just wanted to sell licenses. So as mm. long as the end user companies uh, buy, as, as long as the end user organizations buy a license, use that software, yeah. uh, it's okay that the particular mm. result was, was done with educational or, or research license and, okay. and then transferred into company use. Yeah. So it was like their business logic was just to sell as many licenses <laughs> as possible, not to mm -hmm. you know prevent one result from being used because it was originally done in the wrong yeah. license. But of course we could have okay. done that so that we could have gotten um, that the students would have used the licensed version uh, that was licensed to the company from the beginning. So that would be mm -hmm. also done. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I guess, yeah. And so then, that was one experience, but then again, you know, transferring something done with the university educational or research license to, to, to company, I think yeah. that would be, again, case specific. But if that particular company just wants to sell licenses, then I think you, you would find a solution there. Yeah. Okay. But usually the, the open, open, source licenses are not, they don't have that commercial, non-commercial. They have that permissive copyleft yeah. uh, terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if it's, like, let's say you have a collaboration with a company, but the company people are not using the software, do you think this would count as non-commercial? Or is it sort of going too deep and let's not go oh, there? Yeah, yeah. I guess this is why non-commercial is problematic sometimes. Non-commercial can be problematic. The Creative Commons uh, non-commercial, it's not primarily intended for financial gain. Mm -hmm. So that, that has a sort of like, a, mm -hmm. as I said, Creative Commons licenses are standard licenses. So what is meant by Creative Commons non-commercial licenses is yeah quite clear actually but then yeah if it's a if it's um specifically written license terms by some company then it would be difficult to say what what is commercial in that context but but for creative commons non-commercial it's not primarily intended mm -hmm. for for financial gain yeah okay yeah. Well, now I am out of questions here. Um, so if I was going to summarize what I've learned now, I'd say decide a license sooner rather than later, or else have a time machine. At least at Alto, if you want to open or source something, then you can ask your supervisor. Um, if you want to commercialize something, then it's always going through the head of the unit. And if you need to get help, there's the research data at alto.fee email address, which has, well, 
I think you can reach both Maria and I through there. And if you're um, specific about the software side of things, our Alto Research Software Engineer Service can help you to look at your software and think about what, um, what its particular needs are. Are there any other primary lessons you'd like people to take away, Maria? I think the most important is think about the license uh, as, as early as, as possible. Yeah. Okay. Well, are there any final questions by chat before we turn off the recording? Well, it doesn't seem like it. So, well, Maria, thank you for all thank of you. your feedback here. Um, and I can say if anyone who is listening to this, who's at Alto has any questions, Maria is happy to answer more and we can figure out whatever the uh, problems and solutions might be. Yeah. And yeah, thank everyone. Thanks to you all for watching.